All right, listeners, get ready for a serious brain workout. Today, we're diving deep into Galoani theory. And let me tell you, this is not your average high school algebra. Yeah, it's some seriously mind-bending math, that's for sure. We're talking about a problem that puzzled mathematicians for centuries. How to find a general solution to polynomial equations. Yeah. You know, like those equations with x's raised to different powers. Right, like x squared, x cubed, and so on. And by the 16th century, they had figured out how to solve equations up to the fourth degree. Using basic operations like addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. And roots, of yeah. course. Yeah. But then they hit a wall. Equations of the fifth degree or higher? Totally stumped them. The old tricks just didn't work. Nope. So that's where Galois theory comes in, right? It swoops in to save the day. Exactly. It helps us understand why some equations have nice, neat solutions using radicals. And why others just don't. Exactly. OK, so before we get to Galois, and his brilliant theory. I'm curious about how mathematicians were even approaching these higher degree equations before him. Well, they tried all sorts of clever manipulations and substitutions, you know. Trying to find some way to simplify the problem. Yeah, like trying to solve a giant jigsaw puzzle, looking for those corner pieces to get started. Right, I see. Now, I remember reading that Lagrange, the brilliant 18th century mathematician. Oh, yeah, Lagrange. He was a genius. He made some progress with this approach. He did. He had this incredible insight. He realized that the solutions to these equations, yeah. they're connected to permutations. Basically, different ways to rearrange the roots of the equation. Permutations. So, yeah. like, shuffling the roots around as if they were cards. Yeah, that's a good way to think about it. Okay, so Lagrange is looking at these shuffles, these permutations. Right. And he's trying to understand how they affect what. He focused on rational functions of the roots. Rational functions. Remind me what those are again. They're just functions that can be expressed as fractions where the numerator and denominator are polynomials. Oh, right, right. OK, so Lagrange is playing with these permutations and these rational functions. And he makes this groundbreaking observation. What's that? If a quintic equation. That's an equation of the fifth degree, right? Yep. If a quintic equation is solvable by radicals. Uh -huh then there must be a specific sequence of functions of its roots. And these functions have to have some very particular properties. So he didn't actually find these functions? No, he didn't. But he figured they had to be out there somewhere. Exactly. If there was a neat, tidy solution using radicals, those functions had to exist. OK, but he couldn't find them. Nope. He tried and tried, but he couldn't pinpoint these elusive functions for the quintic. So what did he conclude from that? Well, it led him to suspect that maybe, maybe maybe there wasn't a general solution for quintic equations or even higher degree ones using only radicals. Oh, that's a big maybe. So that's where Galois enters the picture. Exactly. Evariste Galois. A young, brilliant mathematician in the early 19th century. He picked up where Lagrange left off, and he brought this whole new idea to the table, the Galois group. The Galois group. Now we're getting to the heart of the matter. Yeah, it's a really powerful concept. Think of it as a group of symmetries that capture how the roots of an equation are related to each other. Symmetries, like visual symmetry, like in a snowflake or something. It was more abstract than that. Oh, okay. But the idea is similar. Think of it this way. Some ways of rearranging the roots of an equation. Uh-huh. They don't actually change its overall structure. Those rearrangements, those symmetries, yeah. those make up the Galois group. OK, I think I'm starting to get a feel for this. Yeah. But can you give me a concrete example, something to help me really visualize this Galois group? Sure. Let's take a simple cubic equation by 3 plus by 2 plus x plus 1 equals 0. Right. x cubed plus x squared plus x plus 1 equals 0. Got it. Now, to understand its Galois group, yeah. we need to talk about field extensions. Field extensions. Ooh, this sounds complicated. It's not that bad, I promise. Imagine you start with the set of all rational numbers. OK, fractions, got it. Now, to make sure our cubic equation has all its roots, uh, we might need to expand our set of numbers. Some of those roots could be complex numbers. Right, and complex numbers aren't rational numbers. So we extend our set to include everything we need. That's a field extension. So we're creating a bigger set of numbers, a field, where our equation can have all its roots. Exactly. And in this case, the Galois group of our cubic equation, Yeah. it's associated with this field extension. It captures the symmetries of how the roots are arranged within this extended field. So the Galois group is like a map of the relationships between the roots in this new expanded world of numbers. That's a great way to put it. OK, I think I'm following so far. 
how does this Galois group, this map of relationships, actually help us solve the equation? That's the amazing part. We'll get into that more after a quick break. Welcome back. Now, remember we were talking about Galois groups? Yeah, those groups of symmetries. Right, and how they might hold the key to solving equations. Uh-huh. The big question was whether those special functions Lagrange predicted actually exist. Exactly. So, Galois took on that challenge. Ish. Did he find them? Well, he discovered something pretty amazing, but it wasn't quite what Lagrange was hoping for. Okay. I'm intrigued. Tell me more. So, Galois looked at these general polynomial equations of degree 5 or higher. Okay, the ones that were causing all the trouble. Exactly. And he found that their galore groups, yeah. they often don't have that special solvable structure we talked about earlier. So, no neat and tidy solution using radicals for those equations. That's right. Galois essentially proved that those nice formulas mathematicians were searching for, they just don't exist for general equations of degree 5 or higher. Wow, that must have been a huge blow to the mathematical community. It was a major shift in thinking. It meant that the quest for a general formula using radicals was over. But Galois didn't just shut down a centuries-old problem, did he? I mean, we're still talking about Galois theory today. Oh, absolutely. While he closed one door, he opened up a whole new world of understanding. How so? Galois revealed this deep fundamental connection between group theory and the solvability of equations. So he linked this abstract world of groups to something very concrete, like finding solutions to equations. Exactly. And that connection, that's what makes Galois theory so powerful. I see, I see. But hold on. You keep saying general equations. Does that mean there are... NO equations beyond the fourth degree that can be solved by radicals? That's a great question, and the answer is no, not necessarily. Okay, so there's still some hope. There are certain special types of equations, like cyclic equations, that can still be solved using radicals. Cyclic equations, what are those? Remember we talked about permutations, how they're like shuffling the roots of an equation around? Yeah, like those card shuffles? Well, in cyclic equations, those permutations have a very particular pattern. What kind of pattern? They basically move in a circle. It's like rotating the roots around, hence the name cyclic. So there's a certain symmetry to how the roots are arranged in cyclic equations. Exactly. And because of that special symmetry, we can sometimes find those radical solutions. Okay, I'm ready for an example. Hit me with a cyclic equation. All right, how about this? By 7, 1, 1 equals 0. X to the 7th minus 1 equals 0. Got it. And what makes this equation cyclic? Well, the roots of this equation, they're actually the seventh roots of unity. And geometrically, those are points evenly spaced around a circle in the complex plane. Oh, right. They form a nice symmetrical pattern. And that's why it's a cyclic equation. The Galois group of this equation consists of permutations that correspond to rotations of that circle. So each permutation is like rotating the circle, moving one root to another. Exactly. And the whole group has this cyclic structure. Okay, I see the cyclic part now, but how do we actually solve this equation using radicals. The key is to introduce a primitive seventh root of unity. Let's call it U. A primitive seventh root of unity. It's basically a special complex number that helps us generate all the other seventh roots. Okay, so we're bringing in this special number U. And we adjoin it to our field of rational numbers. So we're expanding our number system again, making it bigger to accommodate this U. Exactly. And this little U, it's quite powerful. We can express all seven roots of our equation as powers of U. So U is like a building block for the other roots. That's a great way to think about it. Then we create these special combinations of the roots called Lagrange resolvents. Lagrange resolvents. Hmm. Those sound familiar. Remember how Lagrange was looking for those special functions? Yeah, the ones he couldn't find. Well, these resolvents play a crucial role in solving cyclic equations. They satisfy equations of lower degree than our original seventh degree equation. So we're breaking down our bigger problem into smaller, easier problems. Exactly. We solve those smaller equations using radicals, and then we can use those solutions to work our way back up and find the values of the original roots. It's like taking a detour through simpler equations to reach our final destination. And the structure of our cyclic Galois group, it acts as a guide, telling us which detours to take. I see, I see. So Galois theory isn't just about proving that some equations can't be solved. It also gives us tools to explore the solvability of individual equations. Absolutely. It's like having a specialized toolkit for analyzing equations and seeing if they have those nice radical solutions. This is all incredibly fascinating. We've covered so much ground. 
from Lagrange's struggles to Galois's breakthroughs. And we've even seen how those abstract ideas can lead to concrete methods for solving certain equations. But there's even more to the story of Galois theory. It goes far beyond just polynomial equations. Oh, there's more. I'm all ears. What other secrets does Galois theory hold? Well, for that, we'll need to dive into the final part of our deep dive. Stay tuned. Okay, I'm ready to uncover those secrets. I can't wait to hear what else Galois theory can do. Well, prepare to be amazed because its implications go way beyond just solving those polynomial equations. Okay, you've definitely piqued my curiosity. You mentioned earlier that Galois theory has a lot to do with field extensions. It does. Remember how we talked about those field extensions? How we sometimes need to expand our set of numbers to make sure a polynomial equation has all its roots. Yeah, like creating a bigger playground for the equation. Exactly. Well, Galois theory provides this incredibly elegant way to understand how those extensions are structured. And there's this beautiful correspondence. A correspondence. Between what? Between subgroups of the Galois group and what we call intermediate fields within a field extension. Wait, subgroups? Intermediate fields. Can you unpack those terms for me? Sure, sure. Let's start with a visual. Imagine we have our base field, like the rational numbers. Okay, got it. Good old fractions. Right. Then we extend it to include all the roots of our polynomial. Creating a larger field. Exactly. Now, within this larger field, we might find other fields. Other fields. Yeah, fields that contain the base field but are smaller than the full extension. These are called intermediate fields. So they're kind of like in-between fields, like stepping stones between the base field and the full extension. That's a great way to think about it. And here's the amazing part. Each of these intermediate fields is linked to a specific subgroup of the Golo group. Whoa, there's a connection between fields and groups, like a secret handshake. Exactly. It's a one-to-one -one correspondence. It's called the Fundamental Theorem of Golo Theory, and it lets us translate questions about fields into questions about groups and vice versa. It's incredibly powerful. Wow. But you mentioned something about automorphisms earlier. How do those fit into all of this? Great question. Automorphisms are essentially symmetries of a field. Symmetries. Again, they seem to be everywhere in Galois theory. They are. It's all about the symmetry, really. Okay, so tell me about these symmetries of a field. Think of automorphisms as functions that rearrange the elements of a field. They shuffle things around. Yes, but they do it in a way that preserves the field's structure. So it's like rearranging a deck of cards, but you have to keep certain cards, like those representing the base field, in a particular order. That's a perfect analogy. And get this, the Galois group of a field extension is actually the group of all those automorphisms that fix the base field. They shuffle everything else but leave the base field elements untouched. This is all so mind-blowingly beautiful. Every piece of Galois theory seems to fit perfectly with the others. It's amazing. But I know you said that Galois theory has applications beyond polynomial equations. Can you give me a taste of what those might be? Absolutely. One of the coolest applications is in geometric constructions. You know, those classic problems like squaring the circle or trisecting an angle using only a compass and straight edge. Oh, yeah. I remember those from geometry class. They seemed impossible to solve. And for good reason. It turns out that each of those constructions can be represented by a specific field extension. So we're connecting geometry to fields now. Exactly. And Galois theory tells us that for a construction to be possible using only a compass and straight edge, the degree of the corresponding field extension has to be a power of two. So there's a numerical restriction based on the tools we're allowed to use. Precisely. And for those classic problems like squaring the circle or trisecting an angle, the field extensions just don't have the right degree. They're not powers of two, so the constructions are impossible. Wow, so Galois theory actually gives us a concrete explanation for why those constructions, which have baffled mathematicians for centuries, are actually impossible. That's incredible. It is. It really highlights the power of the theory. And the applications don't stop there. Galois theory has connections to number theory, algebraic geometry, even cryptography. It's truly a remarkable theory. It really is. We started with polynomial equations, and now we've gone through fields, groups, automorphisms, and even geometric constructions. It's like Galois theory is a portal connecting all these different mathematical universes. It really is. And that's what makes math so beautiful. It's all connected in these intricate and surprising ways. Well, I think we've reached the end of our deep dive. Thank you so much for guiding us through this incredible world of Galois theory. It was my pleasure. Galois theory is a passion of mine, and I'm always happy to share it. And to our listeners, if you're even a little bit intrigued by math and its hidden connections, I encourage you to explore Galois theory further. 
It's a journey that will challenge your mind and expand your understanding of the mathematical universe. Thanks for joining us on The Deep Dive.